Jesus, I ask you now, Lord, that you would help me once again communicate and articulate this word, this message to this generation. I pray, oh God, that you would open up the hearts and minds of those that are here today to receive the rhema word. Remove the messenger and let them hear the message. And I ask you, oh God, that you would move our hearts to want to go deeper, deeper commitment, deeper consecration, deeper into your lordship, your kingship over our life so that we can see a movement take place and see our movement continue to thrive, Father, for the next generations to come. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Unleashing the kingdom of God. So when you talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about God's authoritative rule and reign over one's life. Now, that word unleash, when you talk about unleash, what does unleash mean? In other words, it means fully release without restraints. Fully release without restraint. Total freedom. Amen. I, I picture every time I look, I picture a, a, a big, strong, husky pet bull. Right? That you got on a leash right there. And you know how they are. They're real strong and you're trying to hold them back. Right? And there's a pork chop right over there. Oh, <laughs> Now, now you, you, you got restraints, right? But you already know what he's doing. He's, he, every muscle's popping out of him, his veins, right? He, he wants that pork chop. Amen? But once you, what happens once you release him? What happens to that pet bull? My God. You think that he's just going to sit there and stare at it? No, he's going to go after it with everything he's got, right? And bite into that thing until that thing is devoured, Right? And that's when I think about unleashed. It's something that, that's totally released without restraints, total freedom to move, amen, without any hindrances. So when we talk about the kingdom of God being unleashed, we're talking about a people, amen, who have submitted themselves to God's total reign and rule over their lives so that the power of the kingdom is able to be released through, in and through their life. Now, how many know when that happens, things begin to happen? Miracles begin to happen, right? Lives are changed. Households are impacted. Cities are turned upside down and right side up. Nations are reached, right? That's what's happening, they say, in the global south churches. But what about in North America? And this is why I, 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 I get excited. This is something that, that I want to see. I don't know about you, but uh, I, we've been 40 years, but I, I still I haven't seen everything I want to see yet. I, I'm still not satisfied. I still want to see more of the glory of God. I want to see what I read about in the Bible. I want to see what I, I, I hear about in different places. Uh, and I don't want to just see it overseas in foreign countries. I want to see it in my church. I want to see it in Chicago. I want to see it in San Bernardino. I want to see it here in San Diego. I want to see a move and victory outreach uh, here in the Northern America. North America. I want to see an unleashing of the kingdom of God in our churches and through our churches where drug addicts are being saved, set free, prostitutes are being holy, drunkards are being sobered, amen, lives are changed, families are restored, the miracle, miraculous power of God is evident in this ministry. We want to see our movement thrive. We want to see it continue, can you say amen? So what we're looking at today, at this particular time in the history of our movement, is, is unleashing the kingdom. We want to unleash the kingdom of God. Now, going to our scripture here in Matthew chapter 4, we see that Jesus had just come out of the wilderness from being tested by the devil, being tempted by the devil, right? And we see how he defeated Satan with the written word of God. Every temptation and test that he went through, he passed it. When he came out of that wilderness, he came out full of the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And he just came out of the wilderness being tested. Then he heard that John the Baptist was put in prison. When he heard that John was put in prison, the Bible says he leaves Nazareth. He goes to Capernaum to the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, which was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, that the people who sat in darkness had seen a great light. And upon those who sat in that region in the shadow of darkness, light had dawned on them. Amen. And, and it is there that he begins his ministry. 
Now go with me on this journey. He begins his ministry of preaching the kingdom of God. And what was his message? The simple message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. In other words, turn, change, amen? Change course. Change your way of thinking, amen? Turn from your sin your, and your bondage. Turn from your dead works. In other words, anything that you think that you have to do to get close to God, leave it alone. Repent from it. Turn from it and turn to serve the living God. Get ready because the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. It's coming. It's inevitable. And that was his message, repent. So while he goes and begins to preach this message, while he begins his ministry of preaching the kingdom of God, then we see that he calls men. He calls men to follow him, whom he could disciple, whom he can train. Because even Jesus knew that he wasn't going to create or start this movement or this movement continue without others. Amen. How many know the vision, the mission always requires others? And so he calls men to follow him that he can disciple, he can train. Men who later on would help him in the establishing of the kingdom all over the world. Then in verse 23 and 26, and this is where it gets exciting. In verse 23 and 26, the Bible says this. Then Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demon possessed, epileptics, paralytics. And he healed them. And then it says great multitudes begin to follow him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Amen. Now, when you read this passage, what do you see in the life and ministry of Jesus? What I see is Jesus begins his ministry, and when he begins his ministry, he don't come and start programs and put on events. He goes and starts a movement. He starts a movement that begins to impact lives, impact households, and impact cities. A powerful movement that has continu that continued on through the book of Acts and is still continuing on till this day and will continue on till Jesus comes back for his church. The kingdom of God was being unleashed by Jesus and his ministry. And that generation, my friend, never heard or never seen such a powerful ministry of preaching and healing and deliverance. They never seen anything like it. Then in chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7, he begins to preach and teach about the kingdom living, about kingdom principles and kingdom living. Then in chapter 8, 9, and 10, he continues his ministry of going from town to town, village to village, preaching, healing, and discipling and exposing those men to the need and the vision that was before them. That's where you begin to read that well-known scripture in Matthew 9, 36 and 38. But when he saw the multitudes, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers, the leaders are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest. Pray, disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up leaders, workers uh, that will be willing to go into the fields of human pain and human suffering and reap that harvest that is ready. <laughs> then in chapter 11, we read that, that when John as he was sitting there in prison, begins to hear about the works of Christ. What he does, he calls two of his disciples. And he says to those disciples, I need you to go. I need you to talk to Jesus. You need to find him and talk to him. And you need to ask him, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Even John the Baptist began to have his doubts. Huh? Even John the Baptist, who Jesus later describes as one of the greatest, even he had his doubts. And let me tell you something. There's a generation that even perhaps those that have been around may begin to have their doubts. Is this thing going to continue? Is this thing real? You know, is this the right church? Huh? Is it even, listen, even the greatest have had their doubts. 
He sends his disciples, go, are you the one? Are you the true one? Or should we look for another? And what did Jesus tell those disciples? He says, you go tell John. You tell John the things that you hear and the things that you see. You go tell John the blind still are seen, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are hearing, and the dead is being raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. If you stick around, you can have all the doubts you want. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're still going to hear drug addicts are being saved. Prostitutes are being holy. Drunkards are being sobered. Families are being restored. The inner city is being impacted. Listen, you don't have to have no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that this ministry is a move of God. It started in 1967. It's continuing here in 2019. And it will continue, my friend. Because in our leader ministry and in our leadership, we refuse to die, but we're committed to multiply and make more disciples than ever before to send to the fields of human pain and suffering. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus started a movement. Even John the Baptist had his doubts. And I'm sure that There may be some of this third generation that may face some doubts. But you got to know that you know this is a move of God. Matthew 11, then he goes into Matthew 11, chapter 2, verse 6. After he addresses the crowd about John, that he was the greatest among men, then he makes this statement. Jesus makes this statement. He says this, and from the days of John the Baptist... Until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What was he saying? From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of God has been suffering violence, and the violent are taking it by force. In other words, the kingdom of God has been preached. The kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing, and it is advancing with such holy power, pushing back all darkness, amen. That's why lives are changed and families are restored and amen. people are healed because the kingdom of darkness is advancing with power. And then what does he mean by the violent take it by force? In other words, what he's saying there, and those who are keen enough, those who are sensitive enough and keen enough to recognize that this is a move of God are just as forcefully taking hold of this kingdom. And that's what we're looking for, and that's what is needed in any movement, amen, is not just to stand by and watch it go by, but when you recognize that this is a move of God, listen, you don't just sit on the sideline like Pastor said, you got to jump into this river. You got to take hold of it. You got to just as as forcefully as you see the power of God changing lives, you got to just as violently take a hold of it and say, I want this. I want to be a part of this. That's why people were coming from Jerusalem. They were coming from Decapolis. They were coming from all over. They said his fame spread. Why? Because of the power of the kingdom was being unleashed and lives were being changed. People were being healed. The powers of darkness were being broken. And people began to come from everywhere. Hallelujah. Then in verse 16 and 17 to 19, He says this, but how shall I liken this generation? How shall I liken this generation? He says, it's like children playing in the marketplace and calling to their companions and say, we played the flute, but you did not dance. We mourn to you and you did not lamb it. In other words, even in the midst of that move of God that was going through their city, my friend, In the midst of that great revival, that powerful move of God, there were still those that were there that refused to participate. The music was playing, but nobody was dancing. Just like some of you, amen, the music was playing, but you weren't moving, you weren't dancing. You weren't clamping, amen. In other words, there still were people in the midst of revival 
in the midst of the miraculous move, power of God, amen, they still refuse to respond and accept Christ's message, the message of hope, the message of salvation, no matter how well it was presented or how well it was demonstrated. He goes even further. You want to go a little bit further? In verse 16 and 19, he gives the example of John and himself. He says, look, he says, John came neither eating nor drinking. And they said, he has a devil. The son of man, Jesus saying, I come eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Huh? In other words, as to say to his generation and future generations that no matter how well the gospel of the kingdom is presented or demonstrated, unbelief will not respond to the truth. Hallelujah. And we live in a generation, my friend, that no matter how well the gospel is penetrated or demonstrated or presented, there will still be those that will sit there, stand there, amen, and watch and will not respond. And you got to remember this, anytime the gospel is preached, the gospel of the kingdom, not only is it a message of salvation, it's a message of judgment. Because either those that hear it are going to receive it and take hold of it, or they're going to reject it. And the choice is theirs. God doesn't force anybody. He presents the message, he demonstrates it, and it's up to you to take hold of it. Come on, somebody. Either you're going to accept it or you're going to reject it. There are those that pressed in and those that just stood by and went on business as usual. Amen. Going to work. Amen. Making that money. Going home. Putting on that tube. Sitting back. Amen. Marketplace. You know, the whole works. Not responding. He goes even further. Want to go a little bit further? Then in verse 20 and 24, he rebukes. He rebukes, those, he rebukes those, those cities that refused to repent where most of his mighty works were done. The cities that seen the miraculous, seen the miracles of Jesus. He says, woe to you, Corazon, and woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a long time ago. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Ooh. In other words, those cities that seen the miracles that Jesus did and, and had the greatest opportunity to respond, but still didn't respond, they were going to receive the greater judgment. It's a warning, my friend. It's a warning. It's a warning not only to his generation, but future generations as well. And most importantly, to our generation. Remember, the good news of the kingdom is not only a message of salvation, but a message of judgment. In other words, greater judgment, especially to those who had the greater opportunity because they seen the miracles. They will receive the greater judgment. In other words, listen. How many times have we seen people say their son is in the home, their daughter's in the women's home. They see the miracles happen. They see what God and we still come and we still fail to respond. It's a warning, my friend. It's a warning. Listen, if you have if you, those that, in other words, those that have the greatest opportunity because you've seen the miracle of God. There's no doubt. I mean, I can't deny it. It's right before me. And you still don't respond? That, you know, see, what the scriptures tell me, there are levels of judgment. <laughs> and greater judgment is going to come upon those that know better, that seen it with their own eyes, but yet still refuse to accept the message. Hallelujah. Now we might as well just repent right now. Come on, let's just give it up. Amen. But see, this is a message of the kingdom. 
see, this is what's going to happen because I believe that we're, we're getting, I'm believing God for that third wave. I'm believing God that they're, they're going to get a hold of it. But it's up to this generation to create the atmosphere, to create the platform like Pastor Al, to teach, to equip, to train, and get them exposed to the miraculous, get them exposed to the supernatural, get them exposed to the Jesus movement, get them exposed to the way the Christianity is supposed to be and not get involved in all the other millennial type of things. We are who we are. God birthed us this way. He birthed us in the fire. Therefore, don't you ever, ever be satisfied with smoke. Oh, hallelujah. I said, don't ever be satisfied with smoke. Don't ever be satisfied with somebody else's mantle. Don't ever be satisfied with somebody else's preaching. Don't ever be satisfied by somebody else's. You, no, you are who you are. We are who we are. God wants to use victory outreach. God wants to use us. And he wants to take us and use us to show the world the miraculous power of Almighty God. He did it in 1967 when it was unheard of. He blew the minds of the experts. He blew the minds of that society. And he, I believe he wants to do it again. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. There's a reference scripture to Matthew 11. And it's found in Luke 16, 16. Where then Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. The kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is pressing into it. In other words, when you put Matthew eleven twelve 12 and Luke 16, 16 together, it's very clear that Jesus is conveying to you and I that the kingdom of God is advanced through preaching and pressing in. The kingdom of God is advanced through preaching and pressing in. We want to see the kingdom of God advance through the ministry of Victory Outreach International all over the world. And in order for it to be advanced, it's very clear, through preaching and pressing in. And every generation will have to determine whether they will stand upon this truth or settle for the status quo. Business as usual. In other words, go on in life business as usual, just doing what everybody else is doing in the modern church today, right? Or doing what God has commissioned us and commanded us to do in this world. Someone said this, if Jesus was to come to the modern church today, we would have to explain and teach him about church. See, if we don't continue victory hours with the powerful, dynamic, biblical principles, but rather settle and allow our church or our movement to fall into simply now, today, just doing good deeds and acts of kindness to hurting people. Sound familiar? Or turning our ministry into just a teaching program with schools and educating God's people, but no real impact. Listen, Jesus did not come. I do not read that he came in this world starting programs. But he came into this world with a mighty force and power, and he started a movement. Hallelujah. A movement, my friend. A movement. A movement that advanced, it was advancing with such holy power, destroying darkness. Lives were changed. Households were impacted. Cities were changed. The kingdom of God was advanced all over Israel and the entire world. So the question we want to ask ourselves this morning is this. How can you and I, Victory Outreach, join with him and seeing our movement continue like his movement continued? We refuse to die. We refuse to believe the experts' opinions. We refuse to listen to what they say that it's inevitable that this ministry after this long is going to plateau and eventually decline. 
No, we believe with that probably 1% that says, no, if you make the right changes, if you make the right adjustments, amen, then there's a possibility that movement can continue and it can continue to thrive. And we made up our mind and committed ourselves that we refuse to die but multiply and continue to make the changes. And the changes I want to make is not new programs, not new events, but start the movement, create the movement, fuel the movement. How do we do that? First of all, number one is this. It must be advanced by spiritual passion. Spiritual passion. We can't have dead people. We can't have people there's no life in them. That they know the mechanics. They know the language. They know they wear the t-shirts. They, they flash the colors. They, but there's no power. There's no life inside of them. No, if we're going to advance this church and advance this kingdom, it must be unleashed, amen, and proclaimed with spiritual passion. It's when God's people have surrendered, have committed themselves to live for the kingdom with spiritual passion. Listen, when you tapped in with God, when you surrendered yourself to God, when you totally get into that encounter with God, you can't help but to have spiritual passion. Something happens. Jesus ignites you. His love, his forgiveness, his goodness, his call, his mission. Listen, when there's a vision... People don't perish. They live. They thrive. See, this happens when we've all submitted ourselves. Come on, let's be honest. I'll be the first to admit. Have we really totally submitted ourselves to his lordship? Have we really, really made Jesus lord of our life? Total rule and reign over us. The times that, that we have, you've seen the results, right? Until that trial came or that devil came and put out that fire. And we've seen the results of that. But if we want to see this ministry advance and this church continue to advance, tear down more walls and then tear down more walls and tear down more walls, it must be done with spiritual passion. What is passion? Passion is any powerful, compelling emotion, feeling towards someone, place, or purpose. So the question is this morning, what is your passion? What is really your passion? What gets you up in the morning? What moves you? What drives you every day? What pushes you? Causes you to get up every morning, get out of that bed, and get you through your day, no matter what happened, good or bad, that day? But you're passionate enough, you've got to get up anyway. What keeps you moving, causes you to keep pushing, keep engaging, keep advancing? What is the momentum of your life? Because when you have momentum, listen, when you have momentum, listen, you got steam. I said, you got steam, you got power. That's when you got force, my friend. That means that whatever gets in your way gets run over. That means that whatever gets in your way gets pushed out of your way. That means that whatever gets in your way, it can't stop you. It won't stop you. It will not stop you. You know why? Because you got momentum. You got power. You got force. The kingdom of God is being unleashed in your life. When we talk about the person, that the only person that should give us passion is Jesus Christ. Now, I got to admit, she gives me passion. Amen. Oh, but he gives me more passion. He gives me more passion. He gives me passion that keeps me going, keeps me going. People say, how do you do it? How do you pastor one church? And how do you pastor another? And then go to you. They say, I don't even think about it. I just do what I got to do. Amen. This is what we do, ain't it? If I try and think about it, I'll get bummed out. I'll get tired. I already get tired. You just do it. 
You don't think about it. You just do it. It's, it's your passion. Jesus is my passion. I owe my life. Back in 1960, 1979, I, when I surrendered and I made that self-imposed commitment, that sentence to life, my friend, that there was no turning back, that this was going to be my life, that God, you're going to have to pierce my ear because I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. Listen, I haven't given up on that. That's what keeps me going. Another day, another year, another plane, another country, another city, my friend. He gives me passion. Heaven should be the place that drives us. One day I want to get there. One day I want to see my Jesus. One day I want to see my mom, my dad, those that have gone before, Pastor Cal, even Steve, all the other ones that have gone before. I want to see them. I want to hang out in our victory outreach section. I want to hang out. I want to share with them. I want to cast our crowns together. And also it gives us passions, that God-given vision and mission in life. If you're a part of Victory Outreach, let me tell you something. you got a purpose. There shouldn't be one person here that's bummed out. Or at least I say stay bummed out. Because in life, you get bummed out. Let's be real, amen? We're not walking on water here. But you don't stay bummed out. Remember, we, I said, told the church this morning, listen, every day we all, you and I have a choice. Every day to make a choice, what type of attitude we will embrace for that day. We could either choose to give up, to be bummed out, or we can choose to just deal with it and get up and do what we got to do. It's our choice, amen? Our God-given vision of VO is the vehicle that God uses which we are able to do our part in advancing and establishing the kingdom of God all over the world. It is, it, 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 the vision is us fulfilling the Great Commission. The vision of planting churches, victory homes, UTCs in every strategic city around the world. That's our vision. That gives us passion. Because the I, way I look at it, there's still more cities that don't have victory outreach. There's still more countries that don't have victory outreach. So we ain't finished yet. I said, we ain't finished yet. We still got more work to do. There's still more places to go. That's, we need more disciples. We need more leaders. We need more men and women that will lock in with God and not just live life, but live life for God. What did Paul say? For me to live is Christ. In other words, as long as I live, as long as I have breath, I'm living for Christ. I'm living for God's mission, God's vision of my life. I don't live for myself. Again, culture, society has infected us. That's why some of us just come on Sunday. And then we live the rest of our life for ourselves. Some of us just... just Come and do what we got to do. But a church that's going to unleash the kingdom of people is a totally surrendered. Now, I'm not all the way there yet, but I want to be. I said, I want to be. I want to live for God. How every uh, part of my being wants to just pour myself out for him. What about you this morning? I'm going to go through the points because we run out of time. We're going to advance this kingdom, unleash this kingdom through victory outreach. It must be done not only with spiritual passion, but also with a passionate pursuit of prayer and prayer warfare. Victory outreach is a ministry that has been birthed in prayer. Prayer should be the foundation of our churches. Everything that we do, every meeting, everything we do, prayer should be our foundation, my friend. Everything was birthed out of there. Vision is birthed out of there. Plans, ideas are birthed out of there. Strategies are birthed out of there. Methodologies are birthed out of there. Listen, when it's God's plan and it's God's method, it has to work. It's without fail, my friend. Man's plans may fail, amen, but God's plans never fail. And when a man or woman learns how to tap in with God and get the mind of God and get the eyes of God and the heart of God, let me tell you something. That is a, a, a weapon in the hands of God that cannot be stopped. Our ministry has always been a ministry of miracles, of the miraculous of the supernatural. And that's why we've seen God do 
what no man can do in this ministry, what society could not do in this ministry, what prisons couldn't do, and jails and doctors and psychiatrists and programs couldn't do. We've seen God do in this ministry. This is why we have always been a ministry that's been unique, different, uncommon, particular. So when God raised this ministry, when God chose to raise up a ministry like Victory Outreach, listen, God was thinking out of the box. He had a powerful plan to call and to raise up the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, the base things of the world, to confound the wise, to raise up a ministry that would glorify his name all over the world, all over the world. That's us. That's who, who we are. And that's what God has called us to do. So there's no question. There should be no question. There should be no confusion of what God wants us to do. And it's important for this generation to understand that when you're called of God, if God has called you, then there is no other options. I said there is no other options. People can offer you this and offer you that, but even if you, you, you're going through it and you're going through your process and you ain't got no money, you can say no because I'm called of God. I'm in my process right now. I'm not moving. It doesn't feel good. I don't understand it, but God is working in me. God is growing me. There is no other option. 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 There is no other option but to do what God has called Victory Outreach to do, young man. So therefore, there's no, you might as well give up now. You might as well surrender now. You might as well just come and lay it at this altar and say, Lord, here I am. I surrender my life. I commit my life. I sentence myself. There is no other option. Raise your hands all over this place. See, that's what we're talking about right there. That's what we're talking about right there. He ain't got a choice. I can't even help myself. I don't care who's here, who I came with. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm giving my life. Is there anybody else like that? Is there anybody else? Any other young people here today? Anybody else here today that wants to say yes? Lord, send me. Use me, God. Unleash your kingdom. Unleash your power in me and through me, God. I want to be that man. I want to be that woman. I want to be that young person that can make a difference. I want to see souls saved. I want to see cities impact, households impacted, nations impacted by the power of the gospel. Lord, send me. I surrender. I surrender, God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.